Well, good evening, Calvary Chapel Mobile. I'm sorry that we couldn't be there with you tonight, uh, but we're going to continue on teaching through the Word of God. We're in Numbers chapters uh, 32 and 33 tonight. And the title is Loyalty and Sovereignty. And loyalty means faithful adherence. There are a lot of contracts in life, right? Whether uh, verbal or written contracts, right? Whether a person joins the army, the navy, some occupation, Boy Scouts, or, or signing up for some type of service, you know, contracts are signed so both parties can agree on certain terms. And the point is to be loyal to the contract, to, to live up to the contract and not break it. Or as Christians, we have a contract. The terminology is a covenant. The old covenant is a conditional bilateral agreement that God made with the Israelites. And in the Old Covenant, you know, the Israelites, they were required uh, to obey God and keep the law. And in return, God blessed them and protected them. The New Covenant is a promise of redemption by God to people as individuals rather than as a nation and on the basis of God's grace rather than a person's adherence to the law. So under the new covenant, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, ending the need for animal sacrifices. Now, both of these covenants have to do with agreeing to adhere to what God says. Loyalty means allegiance. Now, the Israelites were called to be loyal to the Lord and put him first. Today we're called to be surrendered to the Lord and enact or live out his will. Right? Loyalty is important to the Lord. You know, some other words for loyalty are commitment, uh, devotion, faith, uh, trustability, dependability. You get the picture, right? So the Lord can use and utilize those who are loyal to him first. And so let's pray, and then we're going to get into chapter 32 of Numbers tonight. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the truth that is contained in your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've written your word to those who love you and follow you. We just pray that you'd speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 32, so the loyalty of the people. Now, victory has to do with the Lord giving strength and wisdom to his kids in order uh, that victory can be had. But there's something to say about being loyal and trusting one another in order to work in unity so victory can happen. Right? When we work together for the Lord and function as one body, as the Bible says, it is fruitful and it is powerful. When we all have the same goal and use our different gifts to accomplish the goal of glorifying God and furthering his kingdom, we are unstoppable. <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the years I led the, a team to Peru for a missions trip, the pastor of that church at Pisco, Peru, he had told me if I could please teach a message on unity. You know, I, I asked him why, and he said, well, the reason is there's a lot of, of infighting and drama within the church. And people were not being effective in their community because of what was going on in the church. So as a result, the people were not being effective for eternity in their community. So I taught Psalm 133, which I'd like to read to you now. And if you don't know it, please even memorize it. Study the meaning of the oil and the beard, the mountain, the oil and the beard, the mountain and the dew because it's important. So it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So when a body of believers work together so much in the name of the Lord, can get accomplished so much. But remember, it doesn't start with a group. It really starts with your loyalty and your commitment and your devotion to the Lord. When everyone is individually faithful to God, then together it's like 
the strength is exponential. And so let's read verses 1 to 5, chapter 32 of Numbers, which says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregants, saying, Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliel, Shebam, Nebo, and beyond, the country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is the land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Verse 5. Therefore they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. So here essentially is the request. Now, the land east of the Jordan was good land for pasturing flocks and herds. It was favorable land. So Reuben and Gad, who were herdsmen, requested to settle in this particular spot. They saw it. They liked it. They wanted it. And remember from chapter 21 that God had given all the land into the hands of the Jews. So this was the time to occupy the land. And these tribes, they would be separated from the rest of the nation by the Jordan River, but they didn't see it as a big deal at this time. See, again, they saw the land was good for their profession and their livelihood, and so they desired it. So they saw the land, they wanted the land, and they pursued it. It's not always healthy to pursue something we see and want, whatever it is. It's important to seek the Lord before we pursue something we like or want or see. So what happens? Well, we see the reaction of Moses in verses 6 to 15. It says, And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now, why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. Verse 10. So the Lord's anger was aroused in that day, and he swore an oath, saying, Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt from twenty years old and above shall see the land in which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Kenizzite, the Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord." Fully. They have fully followed the Lord, right? So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And look, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from the following him, he will once again leave them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all these people. So it's thought that Moses may have reacted a bit too quickly because he thought the tribes were deserting. A great fact about Moses is that he always thought about the nation as a whole. A good leader will not get stuck in the minutia or the details. Rather, a good leader will consistently, constantly see the big picture. They can step back and see the long term based on present circumstances. Moses didn't play favorites, and he didn't show partiality. From Moses' perspective, all the tribes had a function to fulfill within the nation, and if they all worked together, then the goal was met. So Moses saw these two nations as stopping right outside of the promised land, and so not entering into their inheritance. Plus, their self-centered attitude could lead to the Lord's judgment on them. They saw the land, and they wanted to do what was best for them. They didn't have an overarching view of the people. They were only concerned about their own two tribes. There were, you know, there were hesitations here. Like, what if God abandons the nation in the wilderness since not everyone would live inside of the boundaries of the promised land? Well, let's see what happens. We see the defense of the tribe in verses 16 to 19. It says in verse 16, 
And then they came near to him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. It says, We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond. Because our inheritance has fallen to us on the eastern side of the Jordan. And then Moses said to them, Well, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for the war, and all... Oh, let's, let's stop right there. So Reuben and Gad were called a, a brood of sinful men. Okay, so many believe they deserve this title because they presented their appeal without much forethought. So what they did was they communicate to Moses and explain to Moses that they were with them. They were going to fight in order to conquer Canaan. They weren't going to stay on the outskirts and just not help them. How many of us know that the communication or communication is one major key to unity with one another? When there's lack of communication, then there are assumptions that arise. This is why I love studying through the first four books of the Bible, because it says many times, The word of the Lord came to Moses. Says it over and over. Moses knew what to do. He knew what the Lord wanted. He knew where the Lord was leading because he guessed really well. No. Moses knew all these things because he had a constant communication with the Lord. The more more we rely on the source, the less guessing we'll have to do. Right? So there were two tribes, made it clear, these two tribes... Only after they, you know, conquered Canaan along with the rest of the tribes, only then they would go back and settle in the Transjordan territory. Yet under one condition, that they could now build fortified cities so their wives and their children could stay there and be protected while they were out fighting. A good leader protects and looks after his family and household. So these two tribes, they weren't trying to abandon the other people. They would make, they were trying to make an agreement here. And they would help conquer the area and then settle outside of the area afterward. So a compromise happened between the leaders and the tribes. Uh, Verses 20, or verse 20, continue on. Uh, Let's see here, verse 20. Okay, then Moses said to them, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for war, and all you armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from, uh, from before them, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterwards you may return to be blameless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and do what has proceeded out of your mouth. And verse 25, And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moses, saying, Your servant will do as the Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our livestock will be there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will cross over every man armed for war before the Lord to battle, just as my Lord says. So Moses gave command concerning the uh, them to Eliezer the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the chief fathers of the tribes of the children uh, of Israel. And Moses said to them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben cross over the Jordan with you, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land is subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead as a possession. But if they do not cross over armed with you, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. Then the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord has said to your servant, so we will do. We will cross over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, but the possessions of our inheritance shall remain with us on the side of the Jordan. So Moses gave to the children of Gad, to the children of Reuben, to the half the tribe of Manasseh and the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, the king of Bashan, the land with its cities within the borders, the cities of the surrounding uh, country. And the children of Gad built Debon and Etaroth and Eriror, uh, Atroth and uh, Shofan and Jazer and Jogbeha. Beth Nimra and Beth Haran fortified cities and folds for sheep. And the children of Reuben built 
Heshbon and Eliezer and Kajathim, Nebo and Baal Mion, their names being changed, and Shibma, and they gave other names to the cities which they built. Verse 39. And the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. So Moses gave Gilead and Machir, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt in it. Also, Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and took its small towns and called them uh, Havoth Jair. Then Naba, or Noba, sorry, went to, and took Canoth and its villages, and he called it Noba after his own name. So here we have the agreement, essentially. Okay, When Moses said, be sure your sin will find you out, he was speaking about these two tribes, making sure they, uh, they kept their word. Remember, we recently went through Numbers chapter 30, which was all about vows and oaths, and how one who is godly will keep their word. You know, as Christians, we should be able to trust one another because we're honest with one another. Right, we're all called to be loyal to the Lord and, and loyal and trustworthy towards fellow believers and non-believers. Moses made sure that Joshua and Eliezer and the other leaders knew this agreement since Moses, remember, wouldn't be crossing uh, into the promised land. Moses wanted to make sure his leaders knew all the details so when he died, they'd be all set up and all good. This is an amazing trait of a good leader. A good leader will do all they can to prepare their replacement. They won't hold anything back. They'll disciple the one who's taking over for them to be even better than they were. <clears throat> so if these two tribes didn't keep their promise, they lose the land. Now fast forward to Joshua 22. We know that these tribes settling on the outskirts of the promised land actually caused some serious issues. Reuben and Gad are compared to Lot, who, if you remember, Abraham gave Lot whatever land he wanted. Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah because it was pleasing to the eyes. We know how that turned out, right? Reuben and Gad, they wanted this particular land because, again, it would be good for their cattle, yet there'd be repercussions. This is why we often talk and walk by faith, not by sight. Like if I made a decision on where to start a church based on sight, I would probably be in a very tropical location right now, okay? There'd be no rain, there'd be very little humidity, and there would be no traffic and no bugs, right? But I didn't decide where I would plant a church based on sight. Praise the Lord. I, you know, I, I was walking by faith and my wife was walking by faith and we were awaiting God's confirmation. Thank you, Lord. He gave it to me and my wife, a confirmation. Walk by faith, not by sight. You know, things may look good at first, but no matter how it looks, if it's not from the Lord, it will end up, we will not end up in a good place. You know, Eve ate of the tree because it looked good. Sin looks good on the outside. But then when one gives in to sin, it leaves one empty on the inside. So walk by faith no matter how it looks or, or how it seems. Now in verse uh, or in chapter 33 we see the sovereignty of God. Chapter 33 verse 1 and 2 it says there are the or these are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord and these are their journeys according to their starting points. So here we have the account of Israel's journey written by the command of the Lord. Now, this was an abridged account given to encourage future uh, generations. You know, our memories can be deceitful. So it's actually thought that Moses kept a written account of the main ways in which God was working. So the children of Israel went forth in rank and file as an army with banners. Now, they followed Moses and Aaron who were following the Lord. And the Israelites were in a really healthy spiritual place at this point. Right? Like we know, we know that when we are all together in unity, it's a spiritually healthy state to be in. And, and honestly, it reminds me of our, our local assembly. I truly believe that we are in a healthy place right now, and God is and will continue to use us as a church in this community. I think, again, I think he's just getting started. And I was talking with a brother in the Lord who was like, you know, sometimes it seems like I'm the only Christian in Mobile. 
But then I gather with other Christians and realize, he said, like, there are a lot of us. <laughs> it's not just me. This is encouraging because God has people all over the world. Remember when the Apostle Paul went to a new city in the book of Acts, the Lord said, I have people in this city. There's people there doing the work of the ministry, work of the Lord. Everywhere we go, there are so many people being used by God everywhere. You're not the only one. I'm not the only one. So here in verses 3 and 4, we see the departure from Egypt. Verse 3, it says, They departed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month. On the day after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with boldness in the sight of all the Egyptians. For the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had killed among them. Also on their gods, the Lord had executed judgment. And so... I love how the children of Israel are portrayed here. Yes, they, they were slaves, they were victims, but when they were free, then they were freed from Egypt. And the Lord gave them courage to leave as bold conquerors, not feeble victims. It says, on their gods, the Lord had executed judgments. So the, this demonstrates that the plagues that the Lord inflicted on Egypt were not randomly chosen. Right? Rather, they were intended to really humble the Egyptians and chastise their pagan and demonic beliefs in, in Egyptian deities. People will reap what they sow. If you sin, you know, if, if you, um, sin you're going to reap consequences. Also, as the Egyptians were burying their firstborn, this was the time when the Hebrews were led uh, by Moses to escape slavery. So God had a plan and it was executed, right? He followed through and it led to freedom from bondage. And that's what God does. He delivers, he rescues, he frees. So you guys, verses um, five and on, a lot of these verses, it's the journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai, okay? And so from the Ramses to the wilderness of Sinai, it took more than a year, but most of this time was not spent journeying, but in receiving the law of Moses, the law from God. And so what these verses show with all these locations is that the Lord had them camp on the edge of the wilderness. But afterwards, they were led to the heart of the wilderness. They were led to the wilderness of Ethan, of Sin, of Sinai. What's cool is that God's ways go from, from little to great, if you will. Like God usually uh, doesn't usually tell us to be faithful with much until we've been faithful with a little. And this is a biblical principle and concept all throughout the Bible, over and over. I feel like I'm saying this every week, wherever we are in the Bible right now. But when you're faithful with, with, with this, you'll get that. <laughs> It's like now as you go through these locations the Israelites were led, it seems to be a maze going here, over there, backtracking to this other place, you know, all over the place. And it may not make sense to us and even to the Hebrews, but remember, they were just following the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy 32.10, it says, He found him in a desert land. And in a wasteland, in a howling wilderness, he encircled them, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. So the hymn is speaking about the Israelites. Now, speaking of the Israelites at this time, Psalm 107.7 says, And he, God, led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place, which is the promised land. God knew what he was doing, of course. The, the Lord leads his people in the best way, but it isn't always the nearest way. You know what I mean? But if it's God's way, it is the best way. We're led through tough terrain sometimes, not because God wants to mess with us, but because the Lord knows exactly what we need. God knows what you need. So, that's verses 5 through 15. Now, I'm not going to read verses 16 to 49, but this is where the children of Israel went from Mount Sinai to the shores of the Jordan River. Basically, they moved from the wilderness of Sinai. And this retelling of this part of the journey took them about 38 years. Not because of the distance, of course, right? But because God led them to wander because the people had major unbelief and therefore died in the wilderness. So another generation with faith could be raised up 
to take over in order to go to the promised land. And the names of Israel's encampments here in these verses are given in quick succession, more than 30 places. You can read them later if you would like. But there was a lot of activity, but no spiritual progress during this time. There was a lot of movement, but no spiritual growth. You know how some people seem to be moving fast, but nothing is getting accomplished? Well, that was the children of Israel. What this chapter is, it's a testimony of the sovereignty of God in dealing with his people. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. The sovereignty of God doesn't destroy or make inept human responsibility. God is able to will us the freedom to choose and yet still accomplish his purposes. Well, how? Because he's God. <laughs> but this explains, you know, this explains Paul's words in Romans eleven thirty three, which says, How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. There is a lot of truth in the scriptures about the Lord, a lot. But we need to be okay with not knowing everything about the way in which the Lord works, moves, and has his way. We're never going to know 100% exactly what God is doing because he's God. He has his way. And we're to submit our ways, our plans to his way because his way and his will is better. <laughs> there are things about God and his actions that we will never know on this earth, but that should not be something that stops you and I from trusting him fully. In the next section, guys, we're entering, uh, that we're entering, God wanted the Israelites to know everything was going to be according to his plan. According to his plan. So verses 50 to 56, we see inhabited, inhabitants of the land. Uh, verse 50, chapter 33, verse 50. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their high places. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Verse 54. And you shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among your families. To the larger you shall give a larger inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give a smaller inheritance, that everyone's inheritance shall be whatever falls to him by lot. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those who whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. So the, the Lord wanted the children of Israel to take uh, over the land completely, breaking down the altars, the temples, the images, and dividing the land among the tribes. God had told them as much when they were um, camping at Mount Sinai. So one reason that these inhabitants of Canaan were to be taken out was they had been into wickedness for centuries, and now it was time for God's judgment. Another reason for the takeover was that in taking out the pagan nations, the land would be cleared to enter into their inheritance. Right, So the land had to be cleared so the people of God could settle into the land and build a nation that would glorify God. So really the promised land would be the location and an amazing platform for God to display his power. It's all about the Lord, not about the Israelites, right? They were used, but it's all about the Lord, him getting all the glory. The promised land was a location where truth would be heralded, where God's blessing would be seen, where one day his son Jesus would die for humanity. A third reason for a total taking over of pagan, uh, the pagans in Canaan was so the Israelites wouldn't be tempted to worship things other than the Lord. The Israelites were prone to worship images, false gods, pagan things. Even as recent as Baal Peor, the people succumbed to worship of Baal. The pagan shrines were left standing. Israel were quick to exchange the truth of God for a lie. And unfortunately, we know from Judges 2 that Israel, you know, uh, that Israel would give in to idols and images again. 
you know, the more we go through, as we continue on through the Word of God, we see that God gave them every opportunity. This new generation was godly. They were going into the land. Joshua would lead them to conquer, and it would be great so that God's, God's light would shine, so that God would be glorified. But unfortunately, Israel would give in to idols and images again. But the Lord was doing all he could to clear the way and start the nation off right in building and uniting the people of God. So again, this is sovereignty of God. God is in control. You guys, he knows what he's doing. He has his hand upon the life of his children, and we just need to submit, surrender, and say, Lord, wherever you're leading me, that's where I'm going to go. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. However you want to use me, I'm open, I'm pliable, I'm flexible. Whatever you want to do, Lord, here I am. Offering God yourself, presenting your, yourself as a living sacrifice, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's our acceptable service. He's done so much for us, you guys. The, the least we could do is seek him, surrender to him, and say, Lord, here I am to be used by you however you want me to be used. And, and so sovereignty, God is in control. And that's chapter 33. Chapter 32, backing up, loyalty. Just be loyal to the Lord. Put him first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Don't let anything come in the way or... or Go to the top of the list where God gets bumped down the list, right? He should be top number one priority. So be loyal to the Lord, for He is in control. Hey, God bless you guys. I hope you have a blessed discussion time and an amazing rest of the night. And we'll talk to you when I get back.